Hello and welcome. It's Dr. Lewis and I am going to review gastric surgery with you since I expect that we may not have time to get to it in class. So hold on to your hats and let's go. In NUR 180, you discussed obesity. Obesity is an epidemic in this country and it's also being seen as an epidemic in other countries. As you can see and as you already know, there is a lot of comorbidities that occur secondary to a diagnosis of obesity including diabetes, stroke, the cancers. We talked a lot about the cancers and some of the risk factors. Pancreatitis, I like that death is included as a complication. Yes, it is a complication. Sleep apnea, so there's a lot of things that we want to try to avoid. When we're managing obesity, a lot of times they're going to try for least, least restrictive measures or less complicated measures like diet and exercise or sometimes even medication therapy. However, when those things fail, there is an option of gastric surgery. And one of the things that they use to evaluate patients for gastric surgery is body mass index, as well as frame size. So calculation of body mass index, 703 times weight in pounds, divided by height in inches squared, or if you're using kilograms, you don't need the weight, you don't need the 703. So just be aware of that. Your case study mentions bariatric surgery types, and there are two different types. There's a malabsorptive, which is, oh, wait, come back. This one, and this is a RUENY, R-E-O-U-X-E-N-Y. And what they do is they basically chop off the stomach there, they pull the small intestine up, and so then you have this whole stomach and duodenum that are no longer part of the digestive process. And so you have less absorption of nutrients and calories and that is where you get your weight loss. I'm sure right now you can already figure out what some of the problems are gonna be related to this one. Then you've got restrictive ones where you reduce the size of the stomach, either with banding or with sleeve gastrectomy. So there are other options that are just simply reducing stomach size so the patients get fuller much more quickly. So how do they decide who gets it, what, or who qualifies for it? Well, some of that is unfortunately in this country a payer's issue in terms of what does your insurance carrier say. Other things are related to BMI. And universally, the National Institutes of Health have said, and that's where this hyperlink will take you, is that a BMI of greater than 40 qualifies you for having gastric surgery. If you have a BMI greater than 35, but you also have comorbidities like diabetes, sleep apnea, then that may qualify you. For lap banding, which I guess is a little bit less invasive, you can, they dropped it down to greater than 30 with comorbidities. The other considerations for gastric surgery, not necessarily via NIH, but just in general, gastric surgeons will look and see does the patient, has the patient demonstrated a commitment to making a permanent lifestyle change? Because that's the, the other half of this. It's not a magic wand that you can wave over a patient, they have their weight loss and move on with life. The patient needs to be willing to commit to following up. They usually will send them to classes. Um, they don't want them to be a smoker because that just adds to the risks that occur after surgery. So there's things that need to happen prior to oftentimes surgeons will complete gastric surgery on a patient. So preoperatively, there's some things to think about. Prior to surgery, because this is an elective surgery, they are going to ask the patient over the several weeks prior to, to start to maximize their post-op healing potential by increasing their protein intake and also decreasing their fat, sugar, and salt intake to what's considered a healthy diet. And the reason that they're doing that, you're maximizing your healing potential, but it also is going to cause some metabolic changes in your, in your body. It may decrease the size of your liver if you're dealing with a fatty liver. You wanna make sure patients go into the surgery because they're going to, as they get closer, they're gonna become clear liquids only, NPO. Prior to that, you wanna make sure that they're maintaining a healthy fluid balance. Cons uh, considering the comorbidities is important when you're looking at preoperative considerations. You want to make sure that you have addressed if the patient has sleep apnea because that has implications for when the patient is recovering and how they're breathing. You want to also think about what's going to happen to blood glucose, what's going to happen related to healing due to the comorbidities. 
Some things are prevention of complications, and some of that is common to every post-surgical patient, and some things are very specific to bariatric surgery. It's important to know if the patient has realistic expectations of what's going to happen post-operatively, both to their body and, both ar and around them. And has the patient had any kind of counseling or classes prior to? Because there's a lot of things that happen with this body change. And it's not all just physical. And so it's always important to make sure the patient has that emotional support going into this massive life change. So this is a, a uh, graphic that I pulled off of Google image search. It says bariatric surgery, a change of life. And we have this skinny little waist with a flat stomach holding big jeans. And this is, I imagine, some surgeon or some surgery clinics um, advertising and it is implying that you can have bariatric surgery and you can have a stomach that looks like this. So my question is, is this a reasonable expectation for somebody after gastric surgery? If you say no, then you are correct. No, this is not a reasonable expectation. And so if somebody comes in with this expectation, it's important that they need to speak with the surgeon that, you know, to know that they are maybe perhaps dealing with something like this. Okay. Um, and this is the male patient that obviously lost some weight and has a lot of excess skin. And that's a very common thing. And that's a much more realistic expectation when someone has a large amount of weight loss is they're going to have a lot of excess skin, which can create problems medically as well as problems emotionally. In the immediate post-operative times, things to consider about, um, as the nurse, uh, some of the challenges are maintaining fluid volume. As long as the patient has an IV, that's covered. However, once the IV is discontinued, it's important to make sure the patient is attentive to fluid volume intake because with that small of a stomach, you need to make sure that they're keeping up with it and watching the color of the urine to make sure because that can tell them a lot about whether or not they're getting dehydrated. You are going to be wanting to watch the patient for signs and symptoms of peritonitis because that could signify leakage from the site. You need to make sure that the patient understands that bowel function is not necessarily going to be the same as it was pre-op, that they may experience diarrhea where they were constipated before or constipated when there was diarrhea before. Mobility is a concern as well as safety, so you need to make sure that postoperatively the patient's room is set up in such a way that they're able to be mobile but also be safe. Okay. Reducing infection is also a concern, and that's common for any, any patient. Um, even more so if the patient has diabetes because of their increased risk. Finally, wound healing and dehiscence. In the post-operative period, they're going to be experiencing some alterations in nutrition, and initially they may not be getting enough calories in and nutrients in to support healing. This is why preoperatively we really want to encourage the patients to have a lot of good, good proteins and maximize themselves nutritionally. Okay, let's talk about dietary guidelines because this is important. And um, in my research, there's a lot of variety, but ideally you're telling the patient to aim towards a half of a cup to a one cup of food per meal. So think about what you had for lunch, go home, grab one cup measure out of your, your, uh, out of your drawers in the kitchen and say, okay, imagine if that's all you get to eat for a meal. So that's not much, but if you think about what we're doing to the size of the stomach, it makes sense. So one of the things is that initially we may be having the patients eating four to six meals per day because they're such small meals. Initially, you're going to have the patient doing clear liquids, and it's going to be in smaller amounts. Putting a lot of food in, in a small stomach like that is going to cause projectile vomiting. And that's another thing to think about and to warn patients against if they're eating too fast, it can cause vomiting. You don't want that. Patients will progress over the course of days to weeks to pureed foods, then soft foods, and then solid foods. As it relates to the solid foods, they really put a high priority on proteins prior, before anything else, and then vegetables, okay, over starches. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the impact that sugars have on uh, diet on your stomach when you have gastric surgery or weight loss surgery. So um, you want to encourage the client when they are eating solid foods to keep their liquids to between meals because liquids can fill you up. 
and they also will stretch the stomach and stimulate things you don't want stimulated. So your challenges and the challenges for the patient are hydration and maintaining nutritional needs. Long-term complications. Let's deal with the thing on the left first. Okay, this is an infographic and it's looking at alcoholism and addiction post weight loss surgery. And it's very interesting, but it's true. When you either decrease the size of the stomach or reroute the stomach, like Aru and Y, you've changed how your body metabolizes alcohol. So your patients who maybe were able to tolerate you know, a few beers and not have a whole lot of symptoms now are going to find that it takes a lot less to have make them feel intoxicated and those effects are going to be lasting much longer. So it's important to warn patients ahead of time that, that they may end up at risk for alcohol addiction and that they need to be very careful when drinking because it's going to cause an effect. Another issue with this is basically called addiction transfer. If somebody has a food addiction or a sugar addiction, they may transfer that over to alcohol, thinking that that's going to be a better choice because it's liquid. It's not, okay? But that's an important long-term complication. Over here, okay, it's kind of a busy thing, but what you're seeing is this is your duodenum, and these are all these different things that are getting absorbed as the food travels through the duodenum into the small intestine. Well, guess what? When they do a malabsorptive procedure, they basically remove everything up to here. Well, okay, you can already see all the different things that are absorbed in this area of the gut that are no longer going to be absorbed. Okay, think about the implications nutritionally that are going to happen because the patient's now going to have problems with iron absorption, protein absorption. And so that's a long-term complication is malabsorption. Emotionally, you have to think about depression. Patients that come in with unrealistic expectations, they think that gastric surgery is going to change their life and they're never going to be sad again and everything's going to be wonderful. Then oftentimes when they're facing the reality of the amount of lifestyle changes they have to do, and sometimes even the weight loss can trigger problems in marriages. It can trigger problems in a lot of areas. Um, so, it's important that to realize that some patients may be at higher risk for depression post bariatric surgery, even though depression may be what drove them to eat in the first place. Also, all this excess skin, it can create body image issues. So they may lose a bunch of weight, but still feel like they're ugly because they have excess skin there. It is something that can be taken care of surgically, but oftentimes it's something that patients have to pay out of pocket for because it's not something insurance usually covers. Okay, dumping syndrome. This is the big guy. Okay, this is the one that you seem to see a lot of test questions on the NCLEX about. Okay, it's an important topic, especially as it relates to gastric surgery and weight loss surgery. Dumping syndrome occurs and it happens due to rapid gastric emptying. And it can occur after eating. A lot of times if you've had a, a, a meal that has a lot of concentrated carbohydrates or a high carb meal and you're drinking like a, let's say you get like a Big Mac and a huge Coca-Cola. Well, guess what? You're probably setting yourself up for dumping syndrome. In fact, I can tell you, you are setting up for dumping syndrome. Okay. That excess sugar in there is going to cause inappropriate insulin release, which later on is going to drive your sugar down. Okay. You're going to end up having sympathetic nervous systems, activation, which is weakness, dizziness, vertigo, diaphoresis, tachycardia. And then on the other end, you're going to be having abdominal cramping, diarrhea, and it's all related to this thing called dumping syndrome. So generally, they tell patients that if you're eating, number one, no liquids with meals. Meals should last 20 minutes to a half an hour. And this is kind of gross, but they're supposed to chew the food to the consistency of baby food. Okay? And the idea is that that's going to help to decrease the risk of dumping syndrome. But it's key to teach patients that, that if you try to eat too quickly, you will end up with consequences, which is dumping syndrome. So in conclusion, and it's about time because it's almost time up. Risk versus benefits. There's a lot of risks involved, but oftentimes the reduction of some of those comorbidities is enough that it becomes an effective thing. Patients need to have effective preparation and patient adherence to post-op guidelines is key. And I have eight seconds left, so thank you very much for your attention and time, and have a good day.